I want to read together. We're in Psalm 27. There's just 14 verses in the entire psalm. So we're going to read the whole thing beginning at verse 1. But it's Psalm 27. And just whilst you're going there, I want to just express uh, our thanks uh, and our appreciation to those of you who made your way out over this past week out uh, to Carnley. We thank you for that very much. We also thank you for your prayer support there. And we had a good time, a uh, good presence of the Lord in our services. We believe that, that hearts have been ministered to and spoken to. Sad we can't report of souls being saved, but we do trust and pray that, that seed has been sown that will bear much fruit uh, to the glory of the Lord in the days that lie ahead. So we want to just thank you for that, and we do appreciate that uh, very, very much indeed. Psalm 27, verse 1. It's a psalm of David, and he says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me up upon a rock. And now shall mine head be lifted up above mine enemies round about me. Therefore, will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy also upon me and answer me. When thou saidest, seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, my, thy face, Lord, will I seek. Hide not thy face far from me. Put not thy servant away in anger. Thou hast been my help. Leave me not, neither forsake me, O God, of my salvation. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord shall take me up. Teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in a plain path because of mine enemies. Deliver me not over unto the will of mine enemies, for false witnesses are risen up against me, and such as breathe out cruelty. I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of God in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. As always, we just trust that the Lord's blessing will rest upon his own truth. As you read through this psalm of just 14 verses, you can't help but realize that the psalm is probably made up in two, two distinct or two different parts, although the one part does very much run on from the other. In fact, in many ways, it's, it's a psalm of, of nearly two contrasts or a psalm of two opposites. Because in the first six verses, we see David and he's on the mountaintop of faith. His trust, his relationship with God causes him to be above his enemies. He mentions that in one of the verses. He's on the mountaintop. He's having a mountaintop experience with the Lord. And that causes him to rejoice in the Lord. You know, friends, there are times whenever we all, I believe, have been like this. Times in our, 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 our lives and our experience, if, if, if your Christian life is like most people's, you will find there are times in your experiences whenever you are really on the crest of the wave. Those are times whenever you're praying well, you're maybe witnessing well. Those are times in your experience and whenever you're, you're experiencing, whenever you are experiencing the presence of God. But then there are other times, and it's as if you've come down into the trough of the wave, and the blessing of God and the presence of God isn't maybe just as real as you'd like it to be. And your prayer life maybe isn't everything that you'd like it to be. And you're, as it were, reaching out to God. And yet he's, he's not as near 
as he has been at other times, or you feel he is not as near as he has been at other times in your experiences. Have you ever had experiences like that? Well, the psalmist here, he's on the mountaintop, the mountaintop of faith. But then from verse 7 to the end, the change comes in those verses of the psalm. And in those verses, we see him almost in the valley of fear. Those final verses, we see him, he's crying out to the Lord. There's this switch, as it were, from faith to fear, from trust even to trembling, and in a sense, even from confidence to cowardice, as he begins to reach out to God. What a switch or what a contrast there is in these verses. It's a change, as I've already said. It's a change that happens to every single one of us. It happens all of the time. Often, even within the same prayer, we can be praising God. We can be thanking God for his goodness and for his love. And before we finish in prayer, we can be reaching out to him, desperately trying to lay hold upon him. You see, friends, faith and fear, faith and fear, they fight each other for the, the mastery of the soul. Faith in Christ elevates. Faith in Christ lifts the soul. Fear, on the other hand. Fear brings depression. Fear brings disappointment. Fear tries to push the soul downwards, to confine the soul. And so there's a constant struggle. There's a constant fight that's going on in your heart between these two in order that one might master your soul or master that situation. But praise God today, through our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we can be overcomers. Amen. Do you believe that today? Do you really? Praise God, we can be overcomers. The Bible says we are more than conquerors. And through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, friends, Calvary today is a victory. Amen. Calvary's a victory. Praise God. He has triumphed over the works of darkness. He has brought them to an open shame. Jesus Christ came into this world to destroy the works of the devil. And praise God, he accomplished that very thing. Amen. And he brings victory to us through the finished work of Calvary. And we can be triumphant in his name. It says in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, for God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And so I want to just take a look. We're only going to look really at the first three or four verses of this psalm for just a time today. Just a simple message. But I want to focus your attention firmly just upon one or two things that we see here. In the first three verses here, we see David, he's voicing his confidence in the Lord. We see David's delight in the Lord. And can I say this morning, it's based mainly upon three things. It's based, first of all, on the Lord's personal dealings with him. Look at verse 1 for a moment. He says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Look at that verse for just a moment. Do you see how many personal pronouns there are in that verse? The words I and my. They are repeated over and over and over again. Because David's confidence is not based upon something that he has heard about. But David's confidence is based upon something that he has experienced. And his confidence here is based on personal experience of the Lord. You see, over the years... David had proved God in all oh, so, so many ways. He had been through trying situations. He had been through great difficulty. And yet, praise God, he never found the Lord lacking or he never found the Lord wanting on his behalf. Can I ask you today, have you ever done that? Just taking the time to stop and to reflect upon what God has done for you personally. 
You see, I believe we come on a Sunday morning. That's what the table is all about. We look at the Lord Jesus Christ. We come to remember him. But it's a time that we remember him in an extra special way. Because we're confronted again with what it cost him. We're confronted again with what he did for each one of us at the cross of Calvary. And we need to take time to reflect upon what he has done for us. Not what he has done for others, but what he has done for you personally. What he has done for me personally. And friends, this is something that we all should take time to do. Not just on a Sunday morning. But time in our own experience, time in our own quiet time, time in our own meditations before the Lord. Just taking time to reflect upon what he has done for us personally. You know the hymn as well as I do. Count your blessings. Name them one by one. And it will surprise you what the Lord has done. And in some places they sing that all our chorus. Count your blessings Name them by the score. And it won't surprise you. There are dozens more. We should take time to reflect. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I do that. Sometimes I just stop and reflect upon God's dealings with with my own life, my personal experience, his hand upon me, how he saved me, how he led me, me, how he baptized me in the Holy Spirit, and how he has blessed me down through the years. All that he has done for me. I do that quite often. Quite often. And you know, can I say this to you this morning? If you ever feel like giving up, or if you ever feel like giving in, friends, this is good tonic. This is good medicine. Think of the Lord's personal dealings with you. Whenever the prodigal was out in that other country, far from the father's house, whenever the friends were gone, whenever the money was gone, whenever the fun was gone, and whenever the prodigal found himself going through the mill, to coin a phrase, far from where he should have been, he began to reflect. He began to think about the Father. He began to think about the Father's house. He began to to think about the Father's blessings upon his life. He began to think about past blessings that he had experienced, no doubt, in the Father's house. And as he looked and as he thought and as he reflected upon that, he looked back and he began to remember, my Father's servants are better dressed than I am. My father's servants are better housed than I am. My father's servants are better paid, probably, than what he was. And no doubt he felt my father's servants are much better treated than I'm being treated. And look at me here. Look at me. Look where I am. And as he pondered the blessings that he had seen, as he pondered the blessings that he had experienced, he said, I'm going home. (coughs) Oh, friends, I want to tell you this morning, it's good to reflect upon what God has done for you. Especially in those situations of life where you're not on the mountaintop of faith, but in those situations where you are in the trough of the wave. And you are reaching out to the Lord. And you don't experience his presence. And you haven't seen what you thought he was going to do. Or you haven't seen what you wanted him to do. It's good in those times to stop. Whenever discouragement's there. Just to stop. Maybe fear there. Just to stop. And reflect upon the Lord. Think of the Lord's personal dealings with you. Think of the Lord's past dealings with you. Because the prodigal said, I'm going home. I'm going back. I'm going to say, Father, I have sinned against you. I don't expect to be called your son anymore. But give me a job. Put me on the payroll, even as one of your hired hands. And you see, what the prodigal did was, the prodigal dredged up from his memory. 
He dredged up from his memory long forgotten thoughts of his father and his father's goodness. Experience told him that his father would at least treat him with the gentleness and generosity and respect that he showed to the hired help. See, you could be here today. Maybe you're discouraged. Maybe you're not on the mountaintop. And you could be here discouraged. Or maybe you're here today. Maybe you're hurt in some way. Someone has just cut across you or, or something has happened in your life. And you feel cut. You feel hurt. There's maybe even pain inside that nobody else knows a thing about. Or maybe you're struggling just with your Christian walk or struggling with some situation in your Christian walk or in your experience and today you're just discouraged. discouraged. And you see, friends, it's so easy to get tired of struggling. And it's so easy to get tired fighting. And can I say this to you? It's so easy to get tired failing. That's the days we live in. And these things come upon us so easily. But let me suggest to you again this morning, you let your mind drift over all that the Lord has done for you. And I tell you, praise God, discouragement and tiredness and fear will be dispelled by his presence. Little chorus says, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and his grace. You see, he wants to fill your life with glory. He wants to fill your life with praise. He wants to fill your life with the assurance that he's the God who never fails and praise God, he cannot fail even for you in your situation. And as you reflect upon his past dealings, your faith will begin to soar on the wings of faith. Hallelujah. Look at verse 2 of this psalm. Because he says, when the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, came upon me. He's still looking backwards. He says, whenever my enemies and foes came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. You see, that was David's past experience. That was what God had done for him. That was how God had dealt with him. His enemies, even with all of their ferocity, they had never been able to overcome him. They had never been able to do him harm. And time and again, God had stepped in and blessed his name. God had delivered him. And friends, he has done the very same for you and for me. You see, you're here today. Isn't that right? Are you? Are you here? <laughs> and listen, you've come through many a thing. You could be here today, and the Lord brought you through something that at the time you were sure you wouldn't get through. A time in your experience whenever there was no light at the end of the tunnel. And a time in your experience when you wondered what on earth would happen or would change to bring you through. But praise God, he brought you through. Amen. Of course he did. And then we're so slow to praise him. We're so, so slow to thank him. In spite of his faithfulness to every single one of us. And so we see the Lord's personal dealings. We see the Lord's past dealings. And today we can say, hitherto hath the Lord helped us. Amen. Of course we can. Bless his name. But look further here, because look at verse 3 for just a moment. He says, though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. You see, we've seen the Lord's personal dealings. We've seen the Lord's past dealings. In this verse, he's speaking about the Lord's promised dealings. He is a future, praise God. There's something up ahead. And he knows that no matter up ahead what he is called upon to face, God is still going to be faithful. As he was in the past, praise God, so he is and so he ever shall be because he's the Lord who never changes. Amen. And so he begins to think and reflect upon the Lord's promised dealings. You see, David had been anointed king. That oil of anointing had been poured upon his head. God had promised him the throne. And friends, can I tell you something? And you don't need me to tell you this. Whenever God promises something, come on. It's going to happen, isn't it? 
The throne was going to be his. Nothing was going to alter that. Nothing was going to be able to change that. Because God had promised something to him. Friends, the Bible's full of promises. You know, we've thought about it before, about the Lord's thoughts towards us. He wants to give us an expected end. Can I ask you this morning, how often do you reflect upon the promises of God? What he has said in his word that he will do for you. Where he has said in his word he will take you to. How he has said in his word he is able to keep you. How in his word he has expressed his love for you. And the fact that he's faithful to you every step of the way. What he has said. What he has said to you and about you personally through the promises of his word. Are those promises fulfilled yet? Because praise God, listen to me, if they're not, if they're not, they will be. Amen. They will be. His word will never fail. And his promises today, praise God, they are completely sure. What he has said about your family, he will do. What he has said about your situation, he will do. What he has said about the church, he will do. What he has said about this church, he will do. Because the Bible says all the promises of God in him are yea and in him amen unto the glory of God by us. Friends, we can stand upon his promises. You know, we sing it, don't we? Standing on the promises of Christ our King. And he is King, amen. Let the truth of that touch our hearts because so often words like that just run off our lips without ever putting the brain in the gear. Friends, he is the king, hallelujah. And he can keep his word and he can fulfill his promises. And so David in this psalm, David has this delight in the Lord. David also in this psalm, as he looks ahead, he has a desire for the Lord. Look at verses four and five for a moment. He says, one thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me up upon a rock. Friends, how we need this kind of desire that David expresses here. We need this kind of desire today. You see, David was a worshiper with a passion, a great passion for God, a great passion for the things of God. But remember this, this is the Old Covenant. This is Old Testament writing. You see, David couldn't go into the inner sanctuary. David wasn't even a priest. Oh, he may have been anointed king, completely different from being a priest in the house of God. And so David couldn't go into the inner sanctuary. Yet we see him here, and that's what he desires. That was his passion. That was what was in his heart, that he might be in the house of God, that he might know the presence of the almighty God. You see, friends, today we are afforded this right to know him. This right to get right into his presence. We are afforded this privilege. The veil, praise God, has been rent in twain from the top to the bottom. From the top because it was God did it, not man. And the way has been opened for you and me. We can know, we can enjoy, praise God. We can stand in the very presence of Almighty God. Yet how often do we really take time to do that? In our own lives, in our own situations. You know, we look at our families. We look at our nation. We look perhaps at our own situation. And friends, if anything is to change, then we need to spend time in the Lord's presence. The thing that's the hardest to do. You know, prayer, prayer is the most alien thing to your natural existence. How do you spend time communing with someone that you can't see? 
you know, people throw you in Hollywell for things less than that. But how do you do that? And prayer and spending time in the Lord's presence is completely alien to the flesh. And yet it's the thing above every other thing that will bring blessing to your life and experience and blessing to the work of God. We need to spend time in the Lord's presence. We need to have a desire for the Lord, a desire for God. Listen to me, please. That's stronger than any desire for anything else. Just God. Give me Jesus. Is that what the hymn writer says? Give me Jesus and Jesus only. Friends, that has got to be the desire of every Christian heart in the world today. A desire that's stronger than any desire for anything else. A desire that puts God first. Because that's what we see in this little psalm. You see, I'm sure David wanted peace. And I'm sure that David wanted souls hounding of him to stop. And I'm sure he wanted to see the promises of God fulfilled. And I'm sure that he wanted the privilege of wearing the king's crown. And I'm sure that he wanted to be back in a proper home with his family and with his friends instead of scouring all around the country in caves and dens and places where he could hide out. I'm sure he wanted all of those things. But here's the point above all of that. Before all of those things, David just wanted God. Is that how you feel about him today? He just wanted God. God was more important than all of the rest. And as I was thinking about this message, I believe this is what the Lord has impressed upon me for this service today. Do you want him before everything else? I believe that's what he's asking every single one of us here today. And you see, you can be here this morning and maybe you need encouragement. And many do. You can be here this morning, maybe you need healing. And I know some of you need that too. You can be here this morning and maybe you need release from, from some hurt, as we've already said. And there are people who need that. Maybe you want to see your loved ones saved and you're here this morning and that's the burden of your heart. And friends, we all want that. Isn't that right? Of course we do. Maybe you want to see, you look around this church, you've been involved in the work of this assembly for years. Maybe you look around this church and you just want to see this building filled with people saved and people worshiping God. You want to see perhaps a real definite move of God. And these are things that many want and some of those things are things that we all want. But today Jesus is asking this question. He's asking, do you want me more? Do you want me more? Do you want me more than anything else? Do you want me in your life more than anything else that you have need of? You see, friends, he has to have first place. We're bought with a price. We're not our own. We're his. He has a right to ask that question of every single one of us today. Do we want him more? Do we want to know more of his presence? And I believe that's the need today. I believe the church of Jesus Christ today needs Jesus. And you know, we preach from Revelation. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in and sup with him and he with me. And boy, we pound the unsaved with that verse. Open your heart's door to Jesus. He's outside the church, friends. Knocking at the church door. And we have got it all together and we have it all summed up and we know what we're about and we're comfortable on that. And he's outside because he's not first place. He's not the passion. He's not the desire of our hearts. The church today needs Jesus. You need him more. I need him more. We all need him more. And it's time that we began to seek after him. Listen to me, please. Not for what he can give us. 
God knows there's enough of that. We need to seek after him more, not for what he can give us. We need to seek after him more simply for who he is. Our friends, he loves us. He's our savior. And yet he's the great and the mighty king. He's the faithful and the true. He's the lover of our soul. Our savior, our friend, he's our guide, he's our helper, he's almighty God. And yet he has called you. And he has called me. He has called us together. And look at what David says here. Let, just look at verse 8 for a moment. We're finished. Verse 8, David, David says, When thou saidest, Seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, Thy face, Lord, will I seek. Has he ever told you to seek him? Can I ask you this morning, have you obeyed that? He says, you'll seek me, you'll find me whenever you search for me with all of your heart. He must have number one place. We must desire him. We must want him above everything else. And he doesn't say in that verse about seeking his blessings. Thy face, O Lord, will I seek. All he wanted was God's face. The shining, the glory of God's face upon his life. That he might be close enough to catch a glimpse of the almighty God. You know, as Psalm says, delight thyself also in the Lord. He'll give you the desires of your heart. We need to learn but to look to him. We need to learn to reach out simply for him. Not just going through the motions, not just coming to ask him for the things that we need of, that we need that he knows about anyway. He knows the things we have need of. We need to learn to seek God. With all of our hearts, seek him. Desiring him before everything else. Let's seek, you know, I remember it, and you've, you've heard it before, I've no doubt. But I remember reading it years ago. It wasn't too long saved at the time. But we need to learn to seek the giver and not just the gifts that he can give. Friends, it's Christ we need. It's Jesus. It's Jesus the unsaved needs. If you're in this service, and you don't know him as Lord and Savior. You need Jesus. Bottom line. You die today in your sin. You're lost without Jesus. You need Jesus. But how does God's people not need him as well? Friends, we need him. You see, you can't live on past experiences alone. Thank God for the recollection of them. Thank God for the encouragement of them. Thank God for the blessing that you can bring into your life. But friends, today's demands aren't yesterday's demands. And the blessing that you experienced yesterday is gone. And so today, we need to be fresh. Fresh in him. Close to him. Seeking his face. Seeking the giver and not the gifts. Look at what he says at the very end of the th psalm. Verse 14. He says there, wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. Heal Strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. In the midst of that discouragement, in the midst of that fear, in the midst of that hurt, whatever it is, that situation, he doesn't say wait and ask God for it. He says wait on the Lord. Oh, that he would come. Oh, that he would bless. Oh, that he would touch. Because praise God when Jesus comes, the tempter's power is broken. When Jesus comes, the tears are wiped away. And he can take the gloom and he can fill the life with glory. For all is changed when Jesus comes to stay. Oh, friends, we need him. How we need him. We need him more than we could ever possibly imagine in these days of time. These perilous days that the Bible speaks about. But he needs to be above everything else. Your heart's desire is just for him. And as you look for him, as you delight yourself in him, praise God, he knows the need. And he can impart into your life everything that you need to fulfill his calling, to be a blessing to others, and to see you through every single situation that you find yourself in in life.
Do you love him like that today? Is he first? Let's just have a wee word of prayer before we sing our hymn together. Lord, you know our hearts today. You know us every single one, Lord. And Lord, as we have just pondered these simple truths, Lord, truths that aren't even new to us in any way. Things that we have probably heard, Lord, so many times, and yet it's good to refresh ourselves. It's good to remember again the claims of Christ. And Father, as you look upon our hearts today, we pray that you will draw from every one of us that which you desire. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to thy precious, bleeding side. Lord, help us to wait upon you, to reach out to you, and to know your presence in a fuller and in a greater way in every situation in life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God.